I'm Jen Kafish, the founder and owner of Great Expectations College Prep. You know, the number one thing we hear from clients in our first meeting is that they don't know what they don't know about the college application process. So as much as it is our job to guide you through this, also wanted to create this resource to help demystify it a bit, because I think it empowers students to understand what factors of a college application really matter? What did they have control over? So trying to help them understand and create a roadmap from freshman year through senior year, you know, what can they be doing to differentiate themselves? Uh, a phrase we use over and over again is authentic but unique. We want students and we try to help students create a narrative and an identity that is authentic but unique, meaning that they will pursue things that they're actually interested in, that are in, you know engaging to them and meaningful but they also do it in a unique way, right? It's how do you stand out in a pile of applicants who want the same major at the same university from similar backgrounds? What's unique about you? What's different? So we want students to be thinking about this throughout high school of how can they take advantage of the many opportunities that exist um, in their four years to really stand out and be the strongest candidate they can be. Now, this also comes with a disclaimer at the beginning because I'm speaking to the masses. There will be certain elements of this where I will try to speak to students who are applying to top 10 schools, right? And the most competitive schools in the world. I'll also have things that are more for students who are kind of struggling to apply to four-year colleges and everything in between. So just know that the vast majority of this will be relevant to everyone, but there will be certain things that might be, you know, more or less uh, relevant to your particular situation. So without further ado, let's jump in here um, and kind of explore the kind of the roadmap to high school that colleges are hoping students might follow and helping students understand what opportunities lie ahead. So components of a college application, just jumping into this, I think it sometimes helps to see what colleges will see, right? You've got everything from high school academics, which we're going to talk about momentarily, standardized testing, which obviously for some colleges is gone, right? It doesn't even exist anymore. It's been eradicated. Other schools are back to test required. Um, but then extracurricular activities and essays and letters of rack and all of these things that are much more subjective. I think students sometimes struggle with how do they put together a story or help define themselves in those areas. So we'll definitely spend time on that. But Knowing that high school academics for colleges is a way to compare you to your classmates, right? I don't ever want this to sound like it's a competition, but at the same time, on a certain level, it is. So there's three areas, and this does depend on where you're applying, right? Because if your GPA, the GPA that's expected at one college is not going to be the same GPA that's expect, expected at another. Um, same with course rigor. Same with class rank, which I'll also talk about in a moment. But knowing that you want, of course, the best grades you can have. So your GPA, you know, always more A's than B's, more B's than C's, whatever, you know, wherever you're at, you want to have the best grades possible. But a lot of students ask, you know, when is it the right time to step up to honors or to APs and how many should I be taking? So course rigor is a challenging one because everyone's different. And I've seen kids who've overdone it on the rigor. They took too many challenging classes and their GPA really took a hit. That's not good, right? We want your mental health, your sleep, like all of your physical health, all these things, but also good grades. So taking a ton of APs for the sake of taking APs, or if you're an IB program, you know, anything, any advanced class, you've got to be sure you can handle it and that it's not going to come at the expense of something else in your life. But that being said, you know, a classic thing, if you go to any college info session at a top university, someone's going to ask, is it better to get an A in a regular class or a B in an AP class? And the answer almost always is an A in an AP class. Because if you are looking at those top 25 schools, they don't want the kid who gets Bs in top classes or heaven forbid, Cs or lower. They want kids who get As. Now, it doesn't mean that a B is the kiss of death, right? There's always stories, there's explanations, there's context to things. But know that the more of those kind of hits you have and dings, if you're looking at a school that generally accepts students with perfect straight A's, that can impact you. But an A in a regular class also wouldn't impress those schools. They want the kids who challenge themselves and then do very, very well. Right Now, most colleges in America, when you're looking at kind of still very competitive, good, rigorous academic type schools, but that are not looking for the superstar top 10% or valedictorians of their class, most of those would rather see students who know their limits than anything else. And I say this because for some kids, that means getting straight A's in all regular classes. Other kids, if they take honors or AP, can do well if they take one, 
right? Or maybe two. So know your limits, do as much as you can. Don't crack, don't take too many. Uh, but know that in some schools, you are, again, most schools, I should clarify, want you to push yourself as hard as you can, but they will be very happy with the kid who has A's in regular classes because that means the kid probably knows where they're at. Now, if you have straight A's across the board in regular classes and never took honors or APs, that sends a message that maybe you're not challenging yourself fully. So there's a balance, right? There's a, a fine line, a little bit of a dance you have to do. So if you're doing really well, maybe try one or two honors classes the next year. Um, you know, when people ask how many APs, by the way, we'll talk about those top 25. And then if you're not shooting there, don't stress. This is usually a stressful number. But so what you always want more than anything is to make sure you're always increasing. So you should never go from a lot to less the next year because it shows either you're not that motivated or it was too much for you, neither of which is a good message for top schools. So think of it as if you are a sophomore, one to two APs is great, right? And by the way, most schools don't let you take more than that. So one to two, and then hopefully maybe three, possibly four junior year, and then four or five senior year. It's always kind of increasing. But keep in mind, if you're at a school that either doesn't have APs at all, um, or doesn't allow you to take beyond X number of APs or honors classes in a given year, colleges know that. They have the context of your school. So this is where class rank comes in. So a lot of people we talk to say, oh, don't worry, our school doesn't rank, right? Yes, they do. Even if they're not doing it publicly and overtly saying you're number 72 out of 439, there is still a class profile that goes to colleges that breaks down the number of APs that are offered, usually average GPA for your class, the highest GPA in your class. So they're getting a sense of where people fall. And by the way, don't forget, they probably have a lot of other candidates from your high school. So they will look at it and go, oh, interesting. Like most people applying have 4.5s and this person has a 3.9. They might've thought a 3.9 was really impressive until they saw the 4.5s in your class. So when we talk about class rank, I don't mean it specifically as an exact number. I mean, compared to your classmates, how are you doing, right? If you're, again, looking at those top 25 schools, they generally want kids who are top 10% of their class. That's a pretty firm number. Not necessarily like if you're 11th, you can't get in, but they are looking for top 10% of class. And if you go to a really competitive college prep school, um, it changes a little bit, not a ton. So we see also a lot of families who realize that, you know, if you're just kind of average at a really competitive high school, that doesn't necessarily put you in a position to be a strong candidate at Stanford, Harvard, Yale, because you're still far below the top students in your own class. So all of these things kind of factor in when colleges are looking at you, but the takeaways here, you want the most competitive grades and the hardest classes that you can handle. And the other factor just to keep in mind with class rank is that this, if you are at a school that offers three APs and you take all three, you're doing the best you can, right? But if you're at a school that offers every single AP that exists, they, there will be probably somebody else taking more than you. So it's always, are you taking advantage of what's available to you? So again, if you're at a school that doesn't offer certain things, it won't necessarily be held against you because you don't have access to it. But if you're somewhere where it's accessible and other kids might be taking advantage, you want to be as well. Now, when we talk about taking APs, look, part of it, it's, it's advanced placement is meant to be a college level class, right? It gives you credits. Um, you can use those credits to either test out of entry level courses. You can use it to just get credit and test out of requirements and therefore have extra kind of free period your first semester of freshman year or having space in your schedule to take extra classes that are just fun or even graduating early, right? You can use these credits a lot of ways. It's great. Um, but it also shows colleges that you're serious about learning, you want to challenge yourself, and that you can hack it in a college level class because keep in mind, you're about to go to college. They want to know that you can do well here. You're less of a liability, right? So we talked earlier about, is it better to have you know the A in the regular class or B in an AP? Look again, a B in an AP is not the end of the world at the vast majority of colleges, but they are primarily worried, can you do well when you get to their campus? And the more APs you've taken, the more data, the more evidence they have that you can handle college level coursework. So this is one thing that they're looking at is, are you really gonna be ready for what they offer? These are all the AP courses that exist. Your high school probably does not have all of these. They might only have a fraction of them. They might have 90%, but recognize there's a lot of languages. There's a lot of math. There's a lot of sciences. And you also have a lot of humanities. So there are plenty of options here uh, to find something that interests you. So even if you are not the most competitive student or you don't seek out rigor at every turn, 
take a look at this list and see what interests you. Maybe there's one class, maybe, you know, convince you to try a computer science class that's an AP level, or you love music or you love art. It doesn't have to be AP physics, right? It doesn't have to be something super intensive. So keep in mind, there are a lot of options out here that could be interesting and fun. Um, and there's a lot of ways to explore fields you haven't had a chance to explore yet in high school. So scores. So this is always one I want to dispel. There, there's a, I don't call it a myth, but there is an understanding out there that if you get an A in the class, your AP score doesn't matter. And now I want to dispel that now because the, the grade, just like we talked about, the grade is what compares you to your classmates, right? They see you got an A in the class or a B in the class. It tells them if the teacher liked you, it tells them, you know, compared, they can see other kids, nobody else got A's, only you did or vice versa. It's comparing you within the context of your school and of your class. AP exam scores are comparing you within the context of the entire country and beyond, right? Anybody who took it. So if you get an A in the class and then you take the AP exam and you get a two, it kind of negates the A, right? They're going to look at that and say, was the teacher just really nice and generous or lazy and didn't teach or didn't teach to the test? They won't know, but something doesn't line up. Similarly, let's say you get a B or even a C in the class, but you get a five. A five is the best score you can get, right? It's basically an A. It's saying that you got an A in a college class. That tells them that maybe you missed one big assignment or the teacher was really mean, but you knew the material. You came out of it knowing what you were supposed to know. So don't discount the importance of the AP exams. Um, fours and fives, by the way, you will send everywhere. Every college is impressed with those. And of course, the Stanford's, Harvard's, and Yale's of the world want to see fives, but fours are still great. Ones and twos, we don't send anywhere. That's that's basically D's and F's, right? That you're not you're not doing great. We're not sharing that information. If they want to know what you got on that, we're just going to pretend you were sick that day and didn't take the test. We're not putting that on your application, right? Threes are the ones that at ninety to ninety five percent of colleges you will send it. Um, and by the way, it may be a hundred, but I'm going to tell you where there's a little bit of gray area, and this is always up to families. And I think depending on the major you're applying to and what red flags would be raised. So if you are applying to those top schools, right, who want the fives and are accepting a fours, a three is not impressive, right, to a Stanford or a Yale type of school. If you're applying there with a three, they're going to be a little disappointed with the three. But if you don't apply with the three and you leave the three off, they might assume it's a one or a two. So look, if you get a three, it's not the end of the world. Don't stress. We This is, again, to, to us, it's major by major, school by school. Is this something they need to know about? They're going to have more questions. Um but this is also me trying to tell you ahead of time, it's important to do well on your AP exams and to take them seriously, prepare for them, treat them with the you know legitimacy and importance in your life that they have. Um, again, not the end of the world if they don't go perfectly, but don't discount them and just take your A in the class and think you're good to go. Um, put effort in, try to get that four and five so you're not on that cusp and having to decide what to do with your three. Now, grades compare you to your classmates. Standardized test scores, like we just said, for APs compare you to the country. So I've got my lovely little pie charts. Everything is relative and there's context to everything. So the schools that don't consider SAT and ACT, clearly not the majority, um, but also APs, a lot of students don't take APs. So to say AP exams are more important is a little bit tough. So that being said, we'll talk in, about both, but with the APs know that even schools that are test blind, they do look at AP exam scores. So this is one more data point that you can give a school, like if you're applying to the UCs or you're applying to Caltech, right? These schools that are not considering scores anymore, they do look at AP exams. So use that. Um, SAT, ACT, again, so APs are more subject-based, right? So they're going to be more, do you know AP US history? Do you know calculus? Do you know Spanish? SAT, ACT is, do you have a fundamental and foundational knowledge of grammar, of reading skills, of general math and fairly basic math, to be honest. So it's looking for a much broader skill set in SAT, ACT. APs are definitely much more specialized. Now, understanding the difference between the SAT and ACT, because this is something, I think the biggest mistake we see students make when it comes to standardized testing is picking the wrong test. So what we recommend and strongly recommend is before you choose a test, take a practice SAT, take a practice ACT, and we offer exams every weekend. The idea is that you take one of each and review those tests with a tutor and go question by question and see what are you missing, but not just what, but why. 
right? Was it a careless error? Are you saying two plus three equals six? Are you reading the question wrong? Did you rush and like just bubble wrong? Did you not pace yourself well? All of these things, or did you never learn that concept? Or did you just forget the formula, right? All of these things factor into, for instance, ACT has this dreaded science section that everybody's terrified of. The science section doesn't really test outside knowledge of science. It tests your ability to read graphs and charts, right? Of the 40 questions, two are going to be outside knowledge from generally middle school science, like gas, liquid, solid relationships and pH scale. But the other 38, you can look at by just looking at, you know, the, or sorry, you can understand by just looking at the graphs and charts that they've given you. The reason I bring this up is that a lot of kids bomb that science section the first time they take it. And they're like, oh, I hate science. I'm terrible at science. And then they're like, I'm better at the SAT. But the reality is ACT was just a little bit of prep and a little bit of familiarity with those strategies needed for science and understanding what they're testing, what they're even looking for, that score is going to go up really fast. So we want to, we look at person with our company, Great Expectations encourages those diagnostics, right? Take each test, go through them very meticulously and with the tutor, understand which one actually plays to your strengths which minimizes your weaknesses, right? Because SAT does give you more time per question. ACT moves definitely more quickly, but it's more straightforward, right? And so these kind of play to different personalities. So if you're too much of a perfectionist, right? One can get in the way more than the other. But I think the math and the reading are the biggest differences. The, the grammar, by the way, is pretty much identical. There's very little that's going to be uh, different in the way they test who versus whom or comma usage, right? They're pretty similar. The math, let's talk about the differences there first and foremost. Uh, the, the SAT, the math, there's two types. There's calculator allowed and calculator not allowed. And the calculator, the no calculator section requires kids, as one would expect, to use math by hand, mental math, right? Doing long division by hand, not a thing most kids are used to doing. But if you're good at that sort of thing, that might be a very easy section for you. Um, both of those math sections also have what's called kind of the grid in the student response section, student free response, where you will actually bubble in your answer like 4.2. You, it's not multiple choice. It's just write in your answer and then bubble in the corresponding numbers. But so you're solving it more as a free response question. Some kids are great at that. Some really need the multiple choice to kind of eliminate answers and feel confident. Um, the reading so the math is a big difference. The reading to me is actually more where it kind of makes or breaks where somebody's going to do well. So I'm an English major. The reading section on SAT, by look, it's it's doable. People do very well on it every day, but it's more analytical and it's testing the best answer, which can get gray. And what I mean by that is if you're, especially if you're a good student, I see the best students struggle with this sometimes the most because there will be more inference questions and more like, you know, the main character might do which of the following in a different scenario, right? Where you're you're trying to understand a little bit more nuance to the text. ACT would be like, where did red squirrels live in the wintertime? And line 27 says red squirrels live in the treetops in the wintertime, right? There's your answer, but it's much faster. So they're testing very different things. And the people always ask, isn't the SAT testing more difficult things and therefore a more respected test? No. They're equally respected and candidly, ACT is more popular. As a side note, this is why the SAT keeps going through all these different iterations. And you've seen in the last 15, 20 years, they went from 1600 to 2400 and then they changed it and they added a section and dropped a section and essay, no essay. And now we'll talk in a moment about the changes coming up in 2024. SAT is trying to keep up. ACT has got a bigger chunk of the market. Um, so their market share is much larger because they are a more straightforward test. So for kids doing prep, ACT is oftentimes a really good choice because it is, it's a more straightforward thing that you can learn. And keep in mind though, like with that reading, when we're talking about, isn't SAT more impressive, colleges look at ACT and go, you need to know how to kind of skim and speed read and grasp and find information quickly. You're going to do a lot of reading and not be able to dissect every word in college. So it just tests a different skill set, right? And they are still looking at the same general math. Um, SAT is a little more algebra two heavy and kind of stats, but not like you don't have to have taken stats necessarily. ACT is a little bit more geometry heavy, but overall they test the same math. Um, so let's talk about the changes coming up for the SAT. So this is something um, that will affect test takers in March of 2024 in the US. They are using international students as guinea pigs as we speak in 2023. The new digital format 
um, will be again unveiled then. The idea of this is you take it on a laptop. You still have to take it at a testing site, by the way. You can't just take it at home. You can bring your own, you can use a school thing, but they're also shortening it from three hours to two. So there's a lot of little changes. They're trying to make it more accessible, a little bit less painful to be shorter, again, to lure students away from the ACT. Um, but here's the big one. This is the thing that I think most people need to understand. So if you're, you know, anything, if you're past this and you're going to already have done, been done testing by March of 2024, great. Or if you're young enough, you'll have a significant, you know, time gap between that and when you're actually going to test. We want to see how this goes, because this is what's going to make a difference. I think for people, whether this is a good fit for them, um, adaptive testing. So parents, if you took some, you know, grad school tests are adaptive. Um, the idea here is that each subject's in two sections, right? So let's use math as an example. So pretend on another standardized test, if there's 50 questions, SAT or ACT, number one and number 50 carry the same weight, right? They're looking at how many did you get right? That's what matters at the end of the day. On an adaptive test, if you miss number one, the system immediately goes, oh, this kid isn't great at math and starts to adjust the test and give you easier questions, but that also maxes out your score. Right. So a careless error early on, the system is now going to be feeding you easier questions, which means you're not going to have a choice or a chance to prove how good you are at math and therefore get in something in the 700s or up towards an 800. You might max out at a 670. Right. Or if you miss too many of them, it'll be even lower than that. The idea I understand what they're trying to do is like obviously be things that are on your level so that they can get a, a good assessment of where you're at. The challenge here is that especially students with test anxiety or any any anxiety broadly, um, it puts a lot of pressure on no mistakes, right? And one of the things we always focus on with other tests is, look, you know, if you need to just kind of make an educated guess and move on, do it. It's not as easy here. So this is something that kind of waiting and seeing for certain students, this might not be a big issue. For other students, it might cause, again, a lot more anxiety, a lot more stress. Um, but our advice at this point is if you're on the cusp and you're somebody who will be testing in the spring, even the fall of 2024, consider ACT, I think as a better choice, at least to start and consider that first, because to be the guinea pig here and to see how this is going to go and colleges won't even be as familiar with it. It's nice not to be the first in this case. Um, now, one thing to keep in mind, we didn't talk about if you have accommodations or will have them and have any extended time. And by the way, there's other types of accommodations. SAT gives out extended time pretty, I wouldn't say freely, but they're much more like if you have a neuropsych evaluation, you have any kind of documentation, they're pretty liberal about saying, great, you're approved, All right? This is partly because extra time on the test doesn't make it that much easier. Uh, ACT, on the other hand, because it moves quickly and it's more straightforward, extra time on the ACT makes an enormous difference. So ACT has kind of cracked down on people just suddenly going to get a neuropsych evaluation, you know, right before they test, sending in all the results and getting approved for extended time and then, you know, blowing the score out of the water. What they're doing now is requiring not just the same kind of documentation from doctors and, you know, anything from, again, neuropsych to there's different medical documentation, depending on if it's a learning difference or a physical ailment, you know, any kind of thing that it depends. But the key part is that whatever accommodations you're requesting for the test have to have been in place at your high school for 12 months. So if you think you're just going to go into testing and be like, I'll get extended time on this because I have a neuropsych evaluation from eighth grade, it's not true if you haven't been using those in high school. So if you're young, use this as a chance. If you have those accommodations, make sure your school has them on record. Make sure you've used them. You know, a lot of kids are like, ah, I might use it later. It's like get those on record so that clock starts ticking and you get that 12 months under your belt. So it's at least an option for you when the time comes. Uh, and obviously, if you don't need standard or if you don't need extended time, this is irrelevant. Don't worry about that part. Okay. Stand or signing up for standardized testing. It really depends. We're going to talk about the different, the world we're in with the, the, you know, test optional op option, basically. So some kids are going to find that standardized testing is a strength, right? It's going to enhance their application. It's going to make them look even better. Other kids going to have the opposite effect, but the majority fall in the middle, right? Where it's like when they start out naturally, it's not necessarily going to be a plus, but if they were willing to put the effort in, it actually could become that. So Let's break this down. So when you hear the phrase test optional, first of all, it means that the school lets the student decide whether they want to send scores. So the example I always give is it's it's like if a school took art, um, art portfolios, right? 
I submit an art portfolio, they would not be impressed. It would be full of stick figures and it would be not something that is going to make them want to take me more than what else I had to offer. But an amazing artist would want to send an art portfolio, right? And round themselves out and demonstrate their talent. Testing is the same way. If you can use testing to be one more solid data point, one more solid thing to tell colleges about your abilities and, you know, your just just your capabilities and also that you're not lazy. Um, a lot of students are capable of doing well on standardized testing, but see the optional part and choose not to do it. Colleges also love the kids who put the effort in, right? So test optional, it depends. Um, one thing I always want to point out because this has been a trend is that test optional schools. So let's make, we're going to make up a school, school X that 2019, let's say their score average was a 27 to a 30 for ACT, right? Which is kind of like close to a 13 to 1400. It's a 27 to a 30. And then the next year they were test optional, right? Because of COVID. Well, what happens is if something's test optional, kids would only send scores if they're on the high end of that range. So no one wanted to submit if they had a 27 or 28, because why would you show that you're lower than their average? So people only submitted with 29 or higher, right? 29, 30, or even above. So then the next year, that average was significantly higher, right? So now their average might be a 28 to a 31 or even a 29 to a 32. Next year, same thing. People only send scores on the high end. This continues, right? And this, if you look at the average score range for test optional schools, it might seem ridiculously high. This is why. So understand again, that where you fall in this, um, you know, for some schools, by the way, you might, when we build a list, we have schools that are going to be kind of easy for you to get in that you're significantly above average others. You're below for the safety schools, for the schools that you are above average, probably whatever test score you have, I shouldn't say probably, but a test score might be something that's good enough to send to safeties and even your target schools, but maybe you don't send it to your top two schools. So you can pick and choose. So don't feel like if you take a test and you get a score, you have to send it everywhere you apply we will select which ones will benefit from that score. So again, if let's say you get a 1350, but your dream school, the average is closer to a 1450, we don't send a 1350 there. But if you're applying somewhere else that has a 1250 average, definitely sending the 1350 and you're probably going to get a nice scholarship, right? So we use the test optional in the way that is the most strategic for you, school by school. Test blind. When you see test blind, they will not consider test scores. Um, SAT and ACT, like we said, they will look at AP exams. But this is, it, it, you see it's kind of regional, by the way, here. There are some schools that are further east that do this as well, but it's a lot of California schools, right? It's the UCs, it's the Cal States, um, University of San Diego. The two that are interesting to me at this point are Pitzer, which are part of the Claremont Colleges, and all the Claremont Colleges didn't go test blind at once, right? Pitzer did, and other schools have different policies within the Claremont College, uh, within the Claremont Colleges. So there's an interesting thing going on where they're interpreting how test optional work for them differently. Pitzer felt like they got a great class without test scores. Some of the others may not feel that way. Caltech is the one that interests me the most, and I find the most curious on a certain level, because Caltech went test blind, meaning, again, if you get a 1600, you cannot send it. They're never going to know. They're never going to see it. But notice that under testing required, MIT went to test required. So the moment these two schools had a choice, of how they wanted to use testing after they kind of did the trial run of test optional at the beginning of COVID, Caltech was like, yes, we love going without tests. We got a richer class. We love the applicants we got. We love the course, the class we built right for the incoming freshman class. They went test blind. MIT had the opposite experience and was like, nope, definitely need scores to be able to compare apples to oranges. Didn't feel like we did a good job. We're going to require tests moving forward. So you can see examples, Georgetown, MIT, Purdue just announced, um, Georgia schools, Florida schools, there's probably going to be significantly more that are going to start announcing back to tests required, especially some of the bigger state schools outside of California, because they're having too hard of a time. They have too many applications coming in, and it's too hard to differentiate from between students. So here's the thing, depending on what year you are, most policies were announced through the class of 2023. Meaning that, you know, the graduating class of 2023, this year's seniors, they are solid, right? Obviously, they know what their own policies are this year. But that was from 2020 till now. There are a lot of schools that have not yet declared what they're going to do beyond that grade. Some have announced to 2024, or 2025. Schools like the UCs are just permanently test blind until they say otherwise. Um, but I say this because if you're young and you look up a school and you say, oh, they're test optional, great, and you're a freshman, by the time you apply, they may not be. 
And on the other way around, right? They might be optional. They might go towards test blind. You don't know. So we strongly recommend that students figure out which test is better, right? SAT or ACT, do the best you can, get scores you're proud of that will be useful at the majority of schools you're going to apply to. And we have them in our back pocket, right? So when you apply, we pull them out for any school that they're going to benefit you at. Um, and keep in mind that the ranges at the schools that require are more reasonable because since people are forced to submit scores, it's not just the best of the best who are submitting scores, it's everybody. So some of those testing required schools actually kind of keeps the craziness at bay. So there's another benefit to that. So when you take the SAT and ACT, again, everyone's different. Uh, a lot of it also depends on when you have sports. So if you're a spring athlete or a fall athlete, of course, if you're both, that makes it challenging, but it is what it is. Um, the number one thing that we care about is where you are in math. So looking at this, so let's just say you're a sophomore in algebra two. You need algebra two for this test. You don't need anything beyond it. Look, there's like one or two concepts that are going to show up in pre-calc, strangely even statistics, but those are things you can fill those gaps very easily. They're very tiny, specific concepts that are tested. If you're not through algebra two, it's tougher. So again, if you're if you're a sophomore, algebra two, the day sophomore year ends, you are ready to start testing. So I, I mentioned this because a lot of people feel like, oh, this is something you do senior year or at the end of junior year. Not necessarily. And I think a lot of high schools candidly kind of get this wrong and the advice they give because they're like, oh, you're a more mature test taker by the end of high school. It's like, yes, but not to the extent. Like, And again, look, there are some students that do need time to mature and build kind of the mental endurance factor. But it's not like you're taking four-hour exams in high school on a regular basis. It's not like there's a grammar class that you're going to suddenly learn who versus whom in junior year, right? Or even your reading skills, they're totally different than what you're learning in English class. So the best marker for prepar for not even preparedness, but for being ready to prepare is what math you're in. So once you've completed algebra two, again, last day of sophomore year, if that's when you take it, prep over the summer, test in the fall, even in the, into the winter. If you are in that situation, take advantage of being done with algebra two early because you can be done with testing early. If you can avoid testing in the spring of junior year, you will be very, very happy. Um, you have you know, potentially APs, you have finals, you're burning out. It's something where it's nice not to have this on your plate as well. But let's say you're taking algebra two as a junior, right? If you're taking it as a junior, now the challenge is that you need kind of everything in that class before you're really ready to test. So what we recommend is that you really don't worry about anything first semester, but around the holidays, you start prep because you need to review three other years of math. You need to review all the grammar rules. You need to learn strategies for the reading and potentially science, right? There's a lot of other stuff to do. So if you start doing that at the beginning of second semester, the idea is that you're still learning algebra two kind of in tandem, right? You are doing both simultaneously. So you're building your algebra two while you're doing all the other review. And by the end of that semester, you're ready to go. So now you might be testing the very end of junior year or that summer right after. In an ideal world, you are done before senior year. Um, this is the number one thing I would like to avoid. So by the way, if you're looking at this timeline, this is not recommending you take it four times. Uh, this is more like, here's the first sitting, here's the next possible sitting. It's like fall, winter, spring. That's more the idea. Um, but anyway, senior year, you have so much on your plate. You have your college essays and applications. You have the hardest coursework you've ever done. You're probably potentially visiting more colleges or trying to sit in on, you know, visiting reps and having conversations. It's a lot. And honestly, we'll talk about the essays and applications in a moment. It's a lot more. Whatever you think it is, it's harder. There's more time that's going to be invested. Try to be done prepping and testing then. Also, because it's really hard to build and finalize a college list if you don't know where your scores are. So if you're like, I think I can hit a 1400, but you end up at a 1250, your whole list is wrong, right? So we want to make sure we have those scores finalized moving out of junior year. Again, earlier is better. Um, and by the way, if you're watching this and you are a rock star who took Algebra 2 as a freshman, the reality is you can test sophomore year. I, again, I know this feels a little crazy to people, but I would say 20% of our students that we work with are done testing sophomore year because they were taking Algebra 2 as freshmen. They're on the advanced track and they knock it out. They're good students. They already have some of the general abilities and we just fine tune from there. So use Algebra 2 as your gauge, but if you're taking it as a junior, you want to start prepping simultaneously um, and then try to be done before senior year. PSAT. This is one thing that a lot of people ask, how important is it to prep for? How, where do the, why do these scores matter? So the PSAT 
is really only important for people who can score in the top one or 2%, right? National merit, finalists, semifinalists type of words, actual scholarship. It's all based on being the top one or 2%. So if you are kind of an average test taker, you can, t- I mean, take the PSAT. I'm not saying don't take it, but know that that score does not matter unless you're in that top, in the 99th percentile, basically, right? So if you are a sophomore, by the way, and you get a perfect score on the PSAT, no one knows. The only year that matters is the junior year PSAT. And when you take that, again, if you score in the 95th percentile, doesn't matter. No one knows, doesn't help you, doesn't get sent anywhere. You need the real SAT or ACT to send to colleges. So when people ask if it's worth prepping for, I said, look, if you want it just to feel comfortable with the test, especially if you're a junior going in algebra two and you want to start easing into testing in the fall, it's great. But don't put too much pressure on the PSAT unless if you're usually in the 90 something percentile, then it's different because if you're already 92nd, 93rd percentile, and we're trying to get you to 98th, 99th, that's reasonable, right? That's something that some fine tuning and some strategy can potentially get you there. And look, having that national merit stuff on your application, it's a feather in your cap. Colleges love it. If you look on their websites, a lot of colleges say we had X number of national merit semifinalists or finalists in our incoming freshman class. Right? It's a bragging rights, basically, is all it is. But it's nice. So just take anybody who tells you to prep for the PSAT, take it with a grain of salt. It's up to you if it matters um, and if it's really going to benefit you enough or if you should put that effort elsewhere. Uh, APs we've kind of talked about, I know they're great out here, but I put this as a point of why you may not want to be testing, you know, in the, in the spring. Um, but don't forget to actually prep for those as well, not just to let them happen. So a balanced college list, these, we use these terms. Everyone has different ones. I have people use likely schools and I have, you know, some high schools use red, yellow, green, right? Green is a go like a safety. Um, but for us, safety means a school where you're significantly above average in terms of GPA, you and test scores if you're submitting them. Um, so think of somewhere that if you didn't get in, you'd be shocked. Not like, oh, I thought I'd get in, but like, and by the way, there are some, especially larger state schools that literally have thresholds of if you have a GPA above X, you're getting in. I've had students who've written, you know, multiple essays for a school, sent everything in, and 24 hours later, they get an alert in the portal that, congratulations, you've been accepted. I was like, great, so glad you read all the essays I wrote. Um, but the GPA was good enough, right? So when we talk about safeties, we want them to be true safeties where we're really confident that kind of the world has to be upside down for you not to get in, right? Targets fall kind of in the middle. Those are schools that you are average, and I mean average in a good way. You are what they generally accept. So if you're applying to a school that generally wants kids with a 3.7 and a 1,300 on the SAT, and you have roughly that GPA and those test scores, that's a target for you, right? Or you're above average on one, below average on the other. Average is good, right, in this context, because you are what they generally accept. But it also means it's kind of 50-50, right? They might have too many like you. You don't really stand out. So when we talk about these things, reach gets the messiest because I think those are pretty clear. I see people who are valedictorian and have a 4.6 GPA who put um, Stanford as a target because they have the GPA that's average and they have the test scores. I was like, oh no, that's not a target for anybody, right? Because you've got to also look at the acceptance rate. So a reach can be somewhere that you're just below average in terms of GPA and test scores, and it's going to be tough for you to get in with your stats. Um, or it can be that you have amazing stats, but the school has very low acceptance rates. So if somewhere has got under a 10% acceptance rate, it's a reach. Doesn't matter how great you are. Even if you cured cancer this summer, it's a reach. So just be aware when we use these terms, this is kind of what we're trying to help you build in a list. And I want you also thinking, I like to look at the data points when we're thinking safety target reach, what we're about to dive into the stuff that's more subjective are the things that you have a lot of control over that help you really make a difference, but you've got to have these things to understand kind of where you fall generally as an applicant. Um, But think of it this way, test scores and GPA are the thing that get you looked at and considered. The rest that we're about to talk about is what gets you in. Okay. All right, extracurricular activities. So when they look at this on your application, they're trying to understand how you spend your time. So this is also something when you're a freshman, I, by the way, I hear all the time that people are like, how am I supposed to pursue my passions if I don't know what they are? I haven't, I, I haven't found it yet. Most people haven't. Most teenagers don't know what they want to do with their life or what their greatest passion in life is going to be, uh, or even currently is, but you should be looking for it. And that's what colleges care about. So if you're a freshman or a sophomore, I want you to think about what can you try, right? If you're like, I kind of like STEM, 
right? You don't even have to love it. You just kind of like it. Try a coding class, try a robotics club, join that, do something that's more pre-med or researchy, right? Find different ways, try an engineering something or other, environmental science, explore clubs, organizations, um, anything. It can be summer programs, find ways to try stuff. That's the number one thing. So freshman, sophomore year, we're not looking for any specialization. We're not looking for any decisions. But if you don't know if you like something, try it. And the reality is you haven't tried most things because if you just came out of middle school, most of these things weren't options there. And even if they were, maybe that teacher was lame or maybe that advisor for the club didn't do a good job. Give things a shot, right? And if you know you like humanities, go deeper and figure out what about them do you like? Because this, there's the academic side that can bleed into extracurriculars, right? So if you are pre-med, for instance, and you are applying to top schools, I have kids all the time who are like, I, you know, volunteered over hundred hours at the hospital. Like, that's great. So did every other applicant applying to those schools probably, right? That's a pretty, it's very impressive, but it's pretty standard for motivated, ambitious students in that field. That's what you do. So we need that thing. We always talk about authentic, but unique. What's the unique thing, right? How do you spend your time beyond that and finding something that really is different than what most people do? Um, now, that, again, can be from the academics, like pre-med or if you're interested in law or politics or something like that. Let's say you're interested in creative writing, by the way. You should be entering contests and competitions. Colleges want people who put themselves out there. It sends a message. So if you could be the best writer in the world, but if you never let anybody see your stuff, colleges aren't excited to have you on campus, right? Because because why? You're not going to necessarily be on the literary magazine. You're not going to be necessarily open to having constructive criticism and feedback from professors. You've got to be open to not necessarily failure, but when you apply for a contest or a competition, odds are against you winning, right? And so it takes a strength of character and kind of self, there's a resilience to anybody who can go into that situation and know they probably won't win. Colleges love it. So then when you do win, of course, those are the ones you list. It implies you've been doing this elsewhere and that you're probably not just, you didn't enter one and win the one. Maybe you did, but but point being, it sends a message that you're open to feedback. You're open to winning or losing. You put yourself out there. So, and that can be for art. That can be for anything. One of my favorite stories is I had a kid who was big into photography, didn't have too many other extracurriculars. I said, we got to find a way to show them how good you are at photography because you've been doing this just for fun. He did it as a hobby. And so we found like a cool summer program where it was like a national geographic photography program, went off, took really cool stuff, came back. Um, the local Rotary Club was had just redone their office and was having a contest for artwork for their walls. And he decided to apply. Um, actually, I pushed him to apply. I was like, just enter. Let's see. It can't hurt. Why not? So he applies. He wins first, second and third place because no one else applied. So he got to put on his application that he swept this entire contest and it's you know, they have no idea how many people applied. So then he got really excited and started entering more and his honors and awards section of the application. So this is what I mean by notable accomplishments on this page was insane. And it just showed a passion for photography that even though it existed, didn't exist had he not entered, right? It would have just been, I take photographs in my spare time, right? It's just very different. So be aware of that when you're talking about notable accomplishments, it's entering things, by the way, if you're into coding hackathons, you know, if you're good at math, there's math league competitions. It's finding things like that. Now, that's all kind of in an academic foray, but it can also be sports. It can be music. It can be theater. It can be um, volunteer work, community service. It can be starting your own company or paid work. There's a lot of ways that you can spend your time productively and notable accomplishments come in many different forms, right? So let's talk about these other little slices of the pie. So leadership, first of all, leadership comes in also many different forms. People think they think captain, they think president, right? They think of titles. That's great. That's awesome. But if you are the president of the car club and you meet once a month and talk about fast cars, that's not that impressive to colleges, right? You didn't do much with it. So as much as those positions are great, make sure when you describe your activity, you can break it down. I always say with active verbs, think of this like a resume, right? Led this, organized this, created this. It doesn't mean you have to be president. You could have coordinated a single bake sale, right? But you've done something. So this is for everything from, again, your sports and your school clubs and your extracurriculars outside of school. And again, it doesn't have to be formal. It can be you had a cause that mattered to you and you got some friends to join and kind of tag along and help them out. Um, that's leadership too, right? Again, don't feel like it has to be formal. There's a lot of great introverts with leadership skills that are not necessarily running for class president. 
Now, volunteer work is, this is the one where I always want to be cautious. You'll notice there's volunteer work and then there's community impact. And I differentiate these because people think of community service, right? And they think of just giving back to your community. That's kind of what volunteer work really is, right? It's go to a soup kitchen, go to a, an animal shelter, right? You're doing things that aren't just for yourself. But community impact is the thing that matters the most. And this is what I really wanted to try to highlight here. If you had to pick one thing to focus on in high school, community impact, right? It's what, when you graduate, the day you leave, what is left? What void exists that was was filled when you were a part of the community, right? And that community could be a small little niche club or group or organization on campus. It could be your neighborhood. It could be, you know, your city. It can be whatever. Um, there are a lot of wonderful things you can do and they might be huge and they might be small. You know, one of my, one of my favorite examples, because I feel like people run out of opportunities or not opportunities, but they can't identify an opportunity. But the main thing here is that you first and foremost, identify a need that no one else has identified or done anything about, right. Um, that you recognize, I, I had a student, for instance, who was interested in medicine and stuff, but hadn't done too much with it and loved dogs. Um, and was trying to figure out, you know, what can I do to stand out? And she was not coming up with anything. So kind of in her boredom with her robotics club, started talking about how she noticed there were some paralyzed dogs at the animal shelter. They got to talking. She was president of the robotics club and they decided to build like on their 3D printer wheelchairs for the shelter dogs, right? And they crafted these and donated them. And it was such a wonderful gesture she always laughs because she's like, it took like two or three weeks, right? She goes, it wasn't that time intensive or that crazy, but it was a great college essay. And forget even just the college essay, it speaks to her character, right? It speaks to her commitment. She saw something and goes, well, these dogs aren't very adoptable. If they can't walk, how can we help them, right? And so finding ways to solve problems or fill needs that exist, that's community impact. And colleges want that more than anything because that's what they want you doing on their campus and what they want you doing in the world while well, wearing their sweatshirt down the line, right? So just think, try to identify, it can be, you know, I would say, start by figuring out who you want to help, right? Is it veterans? Is it immigrants? Is it animals? Is it domestic abuse victims? Like figure out where your heart is and who you want to benefit from your time and effort. And then start looking at what do they need? You know, I had, when you talk about domestic abuse victims, there are some shelters, some women's shelters that you ask them, they have enough toiletries, right? Doing a toiletry drive is great. It's beneficial, but you're not necessarily solving a need that hasn't been solved by other people. They just maybe need more toothpaste, right? But if you look at this and you go, do these women have clothes for interviews? Do they have professional clothing? Maybe do a clothing drive and get people to donate clothes for that. Or saying these women need help putting together a resume to apply for jobs. And how do we help them? And maybe bring somebody in and pay for an expert to come in or in, and present and help them put together resumes. This type of thing, it's it's just showing being proactive, taking initiative, but being a little creative, right? And figuring out what you can do. So think of it as a freshman or sophomore, you're trying stuff like I talked about, right? You're just saying this matters. And same with volunteer work. Do the animal shelter, do the soup kitchen, do the VA, like whatever you want to do, do it. That's great. By junior year, you want to start saying, I think this is my thing right? I care about kids in the inner city who don't have access to blank, whether it's healthcare, whether it's textbooks, whether it's sports equipment, right? And then you start building on that and you find ways, a phrase that's caught on that I honestly hate that I've had to catch on because everyone uses it is the passion project, right? What's your passion project? What's the thing that you're taking the initiative on to do that differentiates you, right? So start identifying that freshman, sophomore year of where what group you want to help or how you want to do this junior year, you start to implement it. And by senior year, it's implemented and you can write amazing essays. You can talk about it and it becomes kind of part of your calling card of, you know, again, I saw this, I fixed it, I did it. And this is something colleges want that somebody who can just take initiative is so rare these days, to be honest. And also for a teenager to be that proactive and probably resourceful counts for a lot. So this is what it looks like on the common application, the section where you're putting your extracurriculars. I bring this up because a lot of people feel like, oh, I'm going to write a paragraph about this activity that I did. No, you're not. If you notice this, you have boxes to check for which grades, so 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, how many hours a week do you do it, how many weeks per year, 
Did you have a leadership position? If it's a sport, did you let her in it? Um, did you win an honor? And then that second line that says activity, you get one line. It's 150 characters. It's a tweet basically, right? You get 150 characters to describe the activity, four years of your investment and involvement in this. So this sounds overwhelming for some people, but here's where it gets interesting. Some people have something that's, they have so many things to say, they cannot fit it all. And maybe we, we break it up a little bit, right? And we break it up into different activities and we want to separate, um, you know, like Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts is sometimes that where maybe the, the gold award or Eagle Scout project is its own thing. And the, you know, more of the badges you earned and the wilderness preparation, like that's something different. You can do that, right? If you have too much to really say, but what's really not good. And this is where I tell you this because you just won't put it on the application in this case. So let's just say you went to a soup kitchen once and you did it and you're like, ugh, I didn't really love that. Six months later, you went to get an animal shelter, right? Or volunteered at a hospital, or whatever you did. If you put on here, you check one box and you say, I did it two hours, one week, one time, never again. And your activity is something like I served soup. <laughs> it's not interesting. It's not impressive. It's like patting your resume in a bad way because it looks so insincere that you never did it again. It looks, it's very clear you didn't do it because this is something that matters to you, right? They're not getting a sense of your personality, your character, what drives you or what makes you tick. They're just seeing that probably your friends were doing it that Saturday and you thought you'd get some volunteer hours, right? And community service hours. So this is why we want you to try a lot freshman, sophomore year and start narrowing junior year so that you can keep checking the box on some. You don't have to continue everything you start. You start picking the things you want to invest more heavily and more deeply in, and you continue with those, right? And of course, you're going to add things as you get older. It's not like everything starts in ninth grade, but think of it that way. And think, we talked about those active verbs, right? Led, created, initiated. Um, but the other thing is if you're looking at, if you join a club, or you're a member of an organization. I see a lot of people who are like, I'm a member of French club. And what they do is, you know, we meet on Fridays once a month and eat baguettes. Great. That doesn't make you a good candidate for college, right? Then nobody's going to be like, ah, now she's in. They're going to look at that and be like, so why did you go? Like, what did you even get out of that? So that description would be much better if you said, you know, coordinated French cooking lessons for the French club or, um, you know, did something nice for the French foreign exchange student who's at your school, but find specific things or pick some French literature that you tried to get everybody to read. Is, you know, that, that's the stuff they want. So if you can't tell me what you did on this, you shouldn't put it. It shouldn't be, this is what the club does. So people get very caught up in, I'm a member of Red Cross and this is what Red Cross is about. People know. What did you contribute? Where's that void? What impact did you have on that organization or club? So really focus on that. Um, now work experience. This is something that I think is unappreciated. A lot of families feel like they would rather have an impressive internship, right? They'd have, they'd rather have something that looks shiny and fancy and impressive. But if you work at a gas station, you bag groceries, especially if you come from privilege, by the way, if you come from a, a good solid background and don't need to make money in the summer to help your parents pay rent, even better, right? They want the kids who need this or don't need this, but choose to do it. And so again, if you're in a position where you do need to earn money, wonderful. That's not obviously not held against you. That's an amazing thing that you're out there doing and you're growing up even sooner than most. But if you're in a position where you don't have to, but you choose to be a Subway sandwich artist or scoop ice cream or work retail, right? You're learning life lessons. You are showing, again, that character that kind of there's integrity, right? Somebody trusts you with their cash register. You show up on time. You're clearly reliable. Somebody who's not related to you is employing you. Um, I do discourage, by the way, working at your parents' office. So even if you want to be a lawyer and your parents are lawyers, it's not ideal because they see on the application where your parents work. And even if you're the most amazing person ever and the most amazing future lawyer, it still looks like nepotism, right? It still looks like you got that because of who your parents were. So don't try not to do that. So you can do an impressive internship, by the way. It's not to say don't do that, but don't discount the benefits that come from paid work. That is again, maybe more on the humbling side and a little bit more unique. You know, I had a student years ago, um, who lived in a very well-off neighborhood. And it was during COVID at the time where you couldn't do too much. And he was getting bored and trying to figure out ways to be productive. So he went around and asked neighbors, he bought a power washer, if he could power wash the inside of the trash cans. 
And that's what he did for a summer. And it was one of those where he couldn't get a real job because COVID and he wanted to do something productive, but the essays were ridiculously awesome because try to picture somebody got a white male from privileged, well-off background, climbing in people's trash cans with a power washer every day, all summer, right? There is something about that kid that already you like a lot. Remember that, right? When you're trying to develop your narrative, it's not always the thing that's fanciest or most impressive or most competitive, but look, you know, NASA has an amazing program in the summer. That's very competitive. If you can get that, do it but don't feel obligated to try to force that. And same with summer programs, there's a million things and we can always help guide you and help give you some examples of programs that would be a good fit for your interests. And you know, whether you want college credit, you wanna stay on a campus, you just want a class, you wanna do research, you want an internship, there's a lot of options. But I want you knowing what's on this page because I think it keeps you from going too deep into something you can't actually expand on. So try to have, and by the way, you get 10 of these. This is the other thing to keep in mind. So there's only room for 10. So a lot of students have done way more than 10, but like a few hours here and there, that looks awful. It would way, it'd be way better to have far fewer that are deeper and show consistency and commitment. Okay, letters of rec. Um, I bring this up. So if you're on the younger side of high school, if you're an underclassman, you're sophomore, freshman, listen, hear this, think about it, but it's not quite as relevant to you because most colleges want letters of rec from junior year and teachers. If you're a junior, listen up. And if you're a senior and haven't done this, definitely listen. Um, your letters of rec, people have a tendency to think, oh, I did really well in biology, right? I'm gonna ask my bio teacher for a letter. That's fine, but what is your teacher gonna say in the letter beyond, yep, got an A, really good at biology, right? You want somebody who's gonna speak to, again, it always comes back to character, right? About this, about your integrity, about how your classmates view you. Are you compassionate? Do you help people? Do you engage in class discussion? These are the things that matter, but somebody who knows you outside of class is even better. So if you have, for instance, a history teacher who's also your debate coach, or your math teacher is also your golf coach, right? Whatever it is, that's an even better person because they can talk about you in different situations and they've seen you in different settings with different people. So if you notice what's being kind of th this little chart that's on the, on the screen right now, this is something that teachers fill out along with the letter they upload for the Common App. So they are basically measuring the student they're writing the letter about on all these things. So it's everything from kind of academic intellectual stuff and quality of writing, original thought, productive class discussion. But notice that very quickly drops into respect accorded by faculty, work habits, maturity, motivation, leadership, integrity, right? All of these things, reaction to setbacks, concern for others, self-confidence, um, initiative, independence. These are things that you cannot have a teacher write a good letter about if you sat in the classroom quietly, even if you got an A plus, right? If you just sit there, do your homework, do well on tests and leave, they cannot write you a good letter. So make sure you are speaking up in class, you're helping classmates who are struggling with material, you go in after class, you're acting sincerely interested, hopefully not acting, hopefully you are, but you are showing that you are sincerely interested in the material, not just the grade, right? And that the no teacher wants to hear, let me rephrase that. Every teacher wants to hear a student has decided to pursue their subject, their course in the future, right? If you're like, this made me want to be a blank, like now I want to be a marine biologist because of this class, or now I think I want to go pursue engineering after AP physics or whatever it is, right? Helping them understand that you have to talk to them for them to know that. These are the things that make a better letter. And notice the way that the, the rankings go is on the far left, it's below average, right? Or technically no basis if like, you know, you're in a chemistry class, the quality of writing or original thought may not be the main thing that shows up um, all the way to one of the top few I've encountered, right? So, and there's a lot in the middle that's like above average, well above average, excellent. You're probably not going to find somebody who gives you everything in the top or the, the far right column, because that's also a little suspicious. So by the way, colleges will look and see if a teacher who's written letters in the past has generally always put everything in the far right. It kind of negates it. So most teachers are smart about this and know that they can't just tell every college that every kid is the top one they've ever encountered. Um, but anyways, if you are a junior or you're younger thinking about junior year, you need to start laying the groundwork for these relationships to have more depth. Who do you think you're going to ask for letters, right? What does that look like? What do you see them telling colleges about you that's interesting? And if you got nothing, spend some time building that relationship and letting them get to know you and if you're, again, younger, start thinking about this. And if you're a senior, 
get on it. You want to request letters by the end of junior year generally, but every high school sometimes has different rules. Some say you're not allowed to ask before a certain day. Others say you have to ask by this day. Others have no guidelines and just say figured out. Um, but know that we usually recommend that by the end of junior year, you should have told them what an honor and privilege it would be for them to write you a letter. They've agreed. And then we know going into the fall that you're going to have letters from these two. You usually want two teachers from junior year. By the way, a lot of colleges do accept outside letters of rec. So from a coach, from a boss, from a family friend, anybody, it, you know, some schools, even like Dartmouth has a peer letter of recommendation they ask for. They want one of your classmates and friends to write a letter for you. So there's a lot of opportunities to help them get to know you, but also think about who's going to write two different things. If you have two different letters going in, they shouldn't sound identical. They should speak to different elements of your personality and what you bring to the table. So speaking of your personality, uh, the Common App essay prompt. So when you hear people talk about the personal statement or the main college essay, this is what they mean, right? So the Common Application is the main application that the majority of colleges are based on and that you're going to send your apps through. Um, these, you notice that these prompts end in number seven, which is topic of your choice. I just bring this up because some people are like, oh, I can't come up with an answer for number two. It's like, that's fine. So it can be like, tell us about your identity, your interests, or a background that's meaningful to you, or some setback or failure that you've encountered. How you, one of them, how did you ever questioned or challenged a belief or idea? Um, you know, one that's a big one is what sparked a period of personal growth or an understanding of yourself or others. And then you'll see things that are just like, what do you enjoy basically, right? What concept do you find engaging that makes you lose track of time? Or what makes you grateful? These types of prompts, again, the last one, topic of your choice, they're just ideas. But I bring these up now because even if you're a freshman and this feels like a lifetime away, you've got to write one of these and these don't really change much. There might be one that's slightly different, but there's always a topic of your choice. So the idea is to come up with stories that will give you a chance to really get your personality through. Um, it shouldn't sound like bragging. You're not just telling them about accomplishments. It should be something. One of the best things I ever heard from a uh, head of admissions was they read their personal statement and letters of rec, they said, but personal statement in particular to decide if they want this student to date or room with their own son or daughter, right? They look at this as, are you a good person? Are you compassionate? Are you self-aware? Are you motivated? Are you funny? Like, what are you? So don't use this to tell them about how you worked hard to get an A in something or you won this big com competition. It's about maybe the effort you put in to win the competition. It's not about the win, right? It's always, and you want to go narrow, so an example I always love to give, just to kind of give you guys a sense of what topics work, what don't, um, you want to avoid cliches, right? Which kind of goes without saying, but it's easy to fall into that trap without recognizing it. So the example I always give is that I had a student ages ago, it's actually date me because it was after Hurricane Katrina, so it's been a while, um, but this is how long I remembered this essay because it was one of the best of my career. Um, the student went to New Orleans to help rebuild after the hurricane came back and wanted to write an essay about how he realized how lucky he was, right? To have a roof over his head and be safe and be relatively well off. I was like, no, you should have already known that, right? Colleges are going to look at that and go, you just figured that out. Like you should have known you were lucky and you should be grateful. So he kept coming back with ideas of like, well, what about how I didn't realize, you know, racial stuff or this is like, no, still cliche. We're not getting anywhere deep. So it kind of kept challenging. I was like, give me, I want specifics. I want moments, like find me moments that were meaningful when you were there. And so the story he finally settled on that turned into, again, one of the best essays I've ever read um, was he talked about how there was a woman in the neighborhood. So he was um, white with a group of white kids from a very wealthy white school. <laughs> it's like, but goes in black neighborhood. And he talks about the racial slurs that were thrown at them most of the time they were there and people were not necessarily always happy to see them. And there was one woman in particular who was very nasty to them and kept saying that they didn't, you know, she didn't need them. Nobody needed them. They get out of their neighborhood. They were fine without them. And it was a constant thing for the week. So anyways, the story that he told me was that they were all terrified of her, but on the last day, they had some extra energy efficient light bulbs from the houses that they'd been rebuilding. They looked over, her car was gone. They thought she wasn't home. So he got chosen to go drop them off on her doorstep and leave them with her before they left. So he goes up, drops them on the doorstep. She is home. She opens the door. She starts to yell at him. She sees what he did and she bursts into tears. And his essay, which was amazing, was about that was the moment that he realized everyone has pride. 
And it became such a mature view of the world as opposed to, I realize I'm lucky, right? That I have a roof over my head and safety and money. It became, no one wants to need help. And he realized in that moment that he came in feeling like I'm doing such a good deed, but no one wants to feel like they need somebody else's charity. And it was such a brilliantly introspective, but somewhat simple essay, right? It's not groundbreaking. He didn't cure cancer over the summer, but it was the realization that was maturity. It showed compassion, kindness, awareness, and he got in everywhere, right? The colleges loved it, but it took a lot of time. So I usually say it's not the topic that's bad. Like him writing about his trip to you know, New Orleans was not the problem. It was that it was too big. So when you have a big concept of, I want to talk about my sports injury, or I want to talk about how I overcame X, broad topics are usually dangerous, but talking about a moment that impacted you, that's better, right? So anyway, so the reason I bring all this up, even if you're young and I want you thinking of this, you are going to write so many more essays than you think you are. You want a bank of ideas. So start just as you go through high school, any experiences you have that are meaningful or impactful write them down, jot them down in notes on your phone, right? And parents, if you're watching this, if there's something that you see that your child grew from or learned from, or kind of made them view things differently or put them on a new path, write that down. Those are big changes, but can also be a subtle moment where you had, you bonded with your grandmother, right? There could be just a conversation. Even if you don't know why you're writing it down, write it down with some detail. And you'll be shocked at how many times there are essay prompts that these things work for down the line. So to give you a sense of the number of essays. So by the way, we recommend generally, I tell kids eight to 12 schools. Uh, no one listens to the eight. It usually ends up being more like 12 to 15. Some kids are good around 10. But at the end of the day, it's not about us limiting you. It's about the quality of the work you can do with the number of essays required. And recognize some colleges have no other supplements beyond this personal statement, right? This is the only one. The vast majority of schools do. Usually it's two or three, but it's up to seven or eight. Some schools have seven or eight extra essays you have to answer. And those are usually slightly more competitive schools, but you know, it, it varies. Um, but I bring this up because when you think of, let's just say you're only applying to 10 schools and you average two to three essays per school, still 20 to 30 essays you're writing, right? And so you've got to have all these ideas. And of course, yes, you can steal from some and help the others, but you want to be able to really give yourself the benefit of coming in with some ideas written down and not starting from scratch when you're a senior. You'll be very, very grateful. Okay, miscellaneous factors. So this is very broad, but this all it all depends on where you're applying, what major, what you're good at, what you've got. And so let's just go through these so you know that these are factors at play. Start with the obvious one, athletic recruitment. So, you know, we have athletic recruitment counselors on staff who will kind of help you gauge are you a D1 athlete? Are you D3? How high academic are you looking? Do you need a scholarship? You're weighing all this. But I say, look, at the end of the day, if you're like the fastest running back in the country, you don't know I need how to read. You'll be fine. You'll go to a great college, right? It will carry a lot of weight if you're amazing. If you're a really good athlete and a really good student, it carries quite a bit of weight, but you're not going to get in over somebody who's significantly more qualified at a top high academic school, right? There's a, a level that you've got to be this much better to kind of counteract if your GPA is a little bit lower than they want. So athletic recruitment can clearly, depending on the sport, the position, all this stuff, it can have a lot of, uh, can have a lot of weight or it can hold a lot of weight or it maybe doesn't. It just depends. Uh, and also if you're in fencing or if you're in football, it's a big difference too. Um, portfolios and auditions. This is something that of course, if you are an engineer, this is irrelevant. Um, but if you're even in architecture, a lot of them want portfolios. If you are obviously an artist, but if you're a dance major or a film major, or, you know, obviously if you're any kind of art singing, anything performing or visual arts, these types of majors, I call them talent-based majors because Yes, your GPA matters, your test scores matter, but also if you're there to be a professional dancer, not as much, right? Your dancing is what matters. So there are some schools that the audition makes or breaks you, and that's all that they really care about to an extent, like you have to be able to keep up otherwise. But there are other schools that it's just a supplement, but they have to accept you really based on the merits of your academic abilities. And this determines whether you get into a certain program. Other times the, the portfolio might just be like, yes, look at, I have a talent, look at my photography, cool, cool, right? Not that you're gonna be a photography major. So it just depends on the college that you're applying to and the path you're on. This can, again, in certain situations have a profound impact, other times very little. Um, high school reputation and relationship. 
I bring this up because this goes both ways, right? And this is something that you can talk to your high school, but the thing that's best is if you have access to Naviance or SCORE or any of those programs that allow you to see the data from previous classes at your high school and see how many have been accepted. What was their average GPAs and test scores? This is great because you can compare it to national average and see if it's significantly above or below, how many people are they generally taking? Um, but sometimes there's just things you can't control, right? There's uh, one of the more prestigious high schools that we worked with had 18 years without somebody getting into Duke. They got into Stanford, Harvard, Yale, Northwestern, Princeton, didn't matter, right? They could get in anywhere except Duke. Duke hated them. No one quite knew why at this point because it had been 18 years. I'm sure for a few years they knew why. But generally that starts with somebody breaking an early decision agreement in the grade above you or if the kids the grade above you or two years above you go and kind of screw around and don't do well and flunk out or get bad grades, they might look at your high school and go, the kids aren't as prepared as we thought, right? Or if somebody breaks an ED agreement, it's almost meant to be, it can be an intentional kind of, they're, they're messing with your school, right? It, it's, it's meant to be a lesson, right? For the school counselors sometimes to be like, all right, you let your family do that. We're not going to take the next batch of kids. So as much as I'm pointing, focusing on the negative, there are the positive, right? There are the colleges that you'll see this at your own high school and other high schools. Your high school is probably somewhat of a feeder to other really good colleges that kids from other high schools have a hard time getting into. So this you'll see this a lot with Catholic schools, right? Where Notre Dame, Boston College, Georgetown, these schools, they have very good relationships, but it doesn't mean you can't get in from another school. It just means that they might accept a higher percentage. And same if you are at you know a really good public high school in a state that takes primarily in-state kids, they're going to be better off than a private school kid in a different state, right? There's, so there's just things that, again, the reason I bring this up is it's not always personal. Sometimes there's factors that you just don't stand a chance, like any poor kid who wanted to apply to Duke. It's like, look, at some point there will be a first who gets into Duke from that school, and there was, but it took 18 years. But kids in between, it wasn't their fault they didn't get into Duke. Something just happened that they had no control over. But similarly, you can benefit from this if there's a great relationship and people before you have gone and done well you will have a higher likelihood of getting in coming from a school that that college's value. So interviews, this is an interesting one because look, if you're interviewing with somebody in the office of admissions, it matters. And this, cause it's, it's rounding out your application. Now they have a face and a voice and a personality to put with everything they read and see down the line. Um, so it always, it always matters, but that matters the most. If you're doing an alumni interview, which is the most common, or some schools even have you do interviews with seniors on, on campus, and it's really meant to be a chance for you to ask questions and learn about the school, that's great. If you do that, you, well, let me rephrase, do it, start there. Part of this is, do you take it? If it's optional, do you take the optional option and actually do it? Because it, yes, it's extra effort. You have to prep for the interview. You have to be ready. You have to put on, you know, good face, look happy, be confident, but I would say it's hard to really mess up an interview. Um, I mean, it can be done, but really it's not about having a perfect interview. It's more about showing up being good because the reality is like a lot of us have done alumni interviews and we don't always get our way, right? It's, we get annoyed at the, the colleges that we are doing these for. I went to Northwestern. I used to do them there. Um, and I was always disappointed that they didn't always take my advice if I loved a kid. But if I didn't like a kid, that usually factored in. Right. So anyways, the reason I bring this up is if you see an optional interview, you are doing it. No questions asked, because I've also seen admissions people that when I, we've talked to them about, you know, why didn't this one student get in? I'm just curious. Like they didn't even bother to interview. They look at it as a lazy factor. Right. So there is that side of it. But there's also the fact that if you get great things written about you can never hurt. Right. Just just use this opportunity. OK, social media goes two directions here. Right. One is that you can follow them. And by the way, students, this also beyond social media. So if you're interested in Michigan, follow University of Michigan on Instagram and everywhere that they've got videos or feeds and let's sign up for their newsletters. Use your email address, by the way, if you're signing up with email um, to get those like newsletters or updates. Because if you if your parents sign up for you, when you apply to college, they don't know it's the same person. They're using the email address to match accounts. So just be sure that you're using whichever one you're going to use down the line. So if you have, you know, an email, it's like gangster for life at gmail.com, change it, make it first name dot last name at Gmail or use your school email address, something like that. It's more professional, but following on social media, 
getting these emails do keep in mind, by the way, colleges are, I think it's like 70, 70 something percent, 78%, I think are tracking not only if you open the emails, but if you click on the links and there's the timestamp. So if they ever look at it, you don't want it to be like, yeah, I clicked on six links at once. It's very obvious. You're not actually reading things, but I bring this up because it's not good to not sign up for these, right? You want to sign up, but if you're going to do it, you have to be careful and be aware of this. So I always recommend to my students, like set a reminder once a week, you go through an email, you can unsubscribe from any school stuff that you know you're not applying to this school, right? If you're getting it from some random university, they're like, I'm not going to apply there. Great. Unsubscribe. Don't cloud your in or crowd your inbox, right? But if you get something from Michigan and that's your dream school, open it, you know, open the email, click on the links, try to read them if you can. Um, but file any emails away that have any relevant information because you have to write a why Michigan essay, right? And if you're trying to tell them why you want to attend, it's going to be really easy if you have a couple of years worth of emails where they're announcing they just opened a new building for engineering or they hired this amazing professor or this research just is groundbreaking and, you know, changed the world. You want to know what's happening there because it makes your essay better down the line. So set that stuff aside, right? Be paying attention to those and don't lose, lose them, put them in a file. Um, social media on the other side, flip side of social media is your social media. Okay. It's going to go wrong so many ways. So I always want people to hear that. Yes, you can, by the way, I know there's kids not on social media. That's totally great and commendable. Um, a lot of kids just say, look, I'm on private. Nobody can find me. That's fine. A few things. So first of all, don't overlook the opportunities that are here. So to be a student who has Instagram that's public and easy to find where, by the way, schools most check out social media. This is part of the process at the majority of schools. So if they can find you and all the pictures are of you with like a hard hat on and a shovel at Habitat for Humanity or at dinner with your little sister or with your parents or your grandparents, and you look wholesome and fun and engaging, it's like a resume and photos, right? You're giving them a chance to get to know you and who you are and what you bring to the table, but it can go the other direction, right? So people are like, I'm on private. They're not going to see bad stuff I post. This is just a warning. And it's a, it's a bad story, but it, it's real. And it happened a few years ago. We had a group um, of students, we worked with half of them, not the other half, but basically one girl took a picture of the other girls, posted it, said something quite inappropriate and racist, um, posted it as a joke. And a girl in their high school who didn't like them took a screenshot reposted it and again, private accounts, right? But they were friends. And so this woman, this girl had access, took a screenshot, posted it publicly, tagged the colleges and half the girls lost, they were seniors, lost their college admissions, right? The other two got put on probation and had to do like sensitivity training. Um, but two of the four got kicked out of their colleges before they even showed up. And I bring this up because they are examples of students who are like, don't worry, my accounts are set to private. And I said, but private where your friends and people you think are your friends can still see things high school people are fickle. People get mad. And I've seen this type of thing. You hear these stories way more than you should, but just please be smart. Don't be stupid. What you post on social media, get through this. And by the way, this goes for life. This is also when you're applying for jobs, right? You want to have a good online presence. But my point is like, if you can use this to your advantage and curate a very clean, kind of healthy, happy, somebody they would want to date or room with their son or daughter type of social media account, way better. That's going to help you a ton. Now, demonstrated interest. This one's murky. There's there's the technically more formal demonstrated interest, and then there's the more informal, which we'll talk about in a second. But formal demonstrated interest, there are schools that consider it, meaning they're actually looking at, do you sign up for their emails? Do you do their info sessions and tours online? Do you visit the campus, right? Do you interact with their reps when they come to your city or to your high school? All of these sorts of things, right? They're they're weighing how much effort are you putting into learning about their college because it gives them a sense of yield, right? It gives them a sense, by the way, rankings are affected by yield, which means if they offer you a spot and you do not accept, it hurts their yield. They are trying to offer spots to people that they are confident will accept the spots in return. So this is why you hear stories of people who get rejected from their safeties. It's because the safety knew that they were a safety because this person had never signed up for an email, never done an info session or two, or never done, had any interaction with the university and just threw in an application, right? So they can look at this going, this kid's never going to come here, right? They have no interest in us. So there are a bunch of schools that do consider demonstrated interest formally as part of their process. 
So when I say informally considered demonstrated interest, these there are a lot of schools that also will very much say we do not consider demonstrated interest. But here's where it gets, I'd say interesting, but also annoying and frustrating. So without naming names, picture school in the far Northeast, rural, isolated. Um, the admissions rep was telling us they don't care about demonstrated interest, but if a kid is applying from Miami or Los Angeles or somewhere that is warm and, you know, city-ish and very urban, they're worried if the kid's going to be happy somewhere that's cold and isolated in a rural setting, right? And the point that he was making is like, well, we want to know that the kid knows the area and knows what they're getting into and is making an educated decision because a kid from Miami who is applying to let's say upstate New York or Maine or wherever and has never been is a liability and unlikely to accept that offer of admissions potentially, right? Now, again, if you financially cannot afford to attend or go visit, you can still do info sessions and tours and stuff. So I always say there's the, the formal is where they actually tell you what kind of, how much it factors into their decision. But the ones that even say they don't consider it are still looking at, yeah, but do you know what the setting here is like? And would you really come and are you really yeah, familiar with the area or what it's going to be like at a really tiny school or a really big school? So just keep that in the back of your mind, because if you can visit colleges, it's good. But the best thing to start doing, even as a freshman, start sending up for those emails, establish a track record. And you can say, I've been interested in you for years, right? I've always been curious about you. Um, but set that up sooner rather than later. Don't wait till senior year to start putting the effort in because it looks less authentic when you do it that way. Speaking of senior year, important dates. This is, you know, for some of you, it's right around the corner. For others, it's going to be years away. But I always just want people to kind of have an understanding of what lies ahead. So this the summer before your senior year, you need to set time aside for essays. I cannot stress this enough. Again, number of essays you think you're going to write is more than you think it's going to be, right? Or you're going to write 20 to 30 is our kind of average, what we see. Um, there are some kids that are a little bit less. There are some kids that are way more depending on where they're applying. Because it's not even about the number of schools, right? It's about are you applying to these schools that have all these prompts? So start as soon as you can. The personal statement, a lot of the like, for instance, the University of California, if you're applying to any of those, those prompts are released in advance. There are a lot of basic ones that are released in advance. Um, that you can start in the summer. August 1st, applications open. So some colleges do confirm and announce their, their extra prompts on their website before August 1st, but I'm old school. I always like to just be positive on August 1st that that's what's showing up on the application because every once in a while, somebody messed up the website. I've seen it a few times over the years where it's like, oh, that was last year's prompts and my kid already started writing them and they weren't right. So August 1st, applications go live. Um, and you can start confirming essay prompts. Some of these you can start filling out before August 1st and they just roll over. But think of it, August 1st is when applications start. October 1st is when FAFSA opens. So if you are considering applying for financial aid, you wanna get this in sooner rather than later, don't wait, right? A lot of people are like, oh, we'll deal with this after applications. A lot of places are first come first serve. They have priority deadlines for financial aid. So the moment it happens on October 1st, I would say set a night aside parents, get into this and get this out as quickly as you can in October, obviously done right and done well, but you want this, you don't want to push this off. Um, November is usually when you have early action and early decision deadlines. Some of them are earlier. You've got a few that are like October 15th, some that are December 1st, but November 1st to 15th is normal. Um, a lot of state schools have deadlines at the end of November, beginning of December, and also scholarship deadlines are usually around there as well. Now, Regular decision, again, there's a lot of exceptions to this, but you're going to have most regular decisions kind of in January between the 1st and sometimes even February 1st, but definitely by the 15th most often. And then you wait. April 1st, colleges release results. Um, there are some, IV Day has recently been a few days after April 1st, but generally by April 1st, you've heard from 95% of your schools. May 1st, you have to make a decision. So I bring this up also so you know that April of senior year, don't make plans. Don't go to Hawaii. Do that another time. This is a great time that depending on where you get in, there will be accepted student weekends. There will be chances to sit on classes, stay in dorms. If you're trying to decide between schools or you need to spend time trying to compare financial aid packages, April's your chance to do that. So April of senior year will be crazy unless you did early action or early decision to your dream school and it got done sooner. Um, but just keep April set aside and know that it's going to get it's going to get real, real fast. 
And that's it. So I hope this was helpful and gave you a little bit of insight and, you know, what to expect in the process. But more than anything, you know, again, it's our job to guide you. It's our job to help you figure out ways to make that narrative unique. And as you're going through high school, that this should be an organic process, but also our job is to constantly show you things that you could do or why this would be beneficial or maybe why you should consider taking this class or joining this club. But at the end of the day, students, it's your it's your path, right? It's your your life, your college experience. And our job is to guide you and make sure you don't hit a place where you realize that, oh, it's, oh if only I had known that this mattered, I would have done it differently. We want you to be in a position where you are making educated decisions every step of the way. And when you get to senior year, you're applying to schools that are a good fit for you. You're a good match. They're going to appreciate who you've become. You know what's kind of on target for you. And you're going to find a school that you're the perfect fit at. And this is the last thing I'll leave you with is that I want everybody, everybody we work with, the goal is the best fit, right? And of course, we want you to go to school. Where you're proud of the school and you're challenged with the workload and the rigor. But at the same time, you want to be somewhere that you can thrive, right? If you're somewhere that you're just desperate to try to stay afloat and you're terrified that you're going to fail out or you can't try a new class because what if you get an F? You want to be somewhere that you can take risks and that you'll be surrounded by people who challenge you and support you. Um, but you know, you're not, yeah, you're not scared. So we want to have, we want to help you identify those schools, but create an application that's gonna appeal to those schools as well. So um if you haven't already taken advantage, you know, I always offer the free 30-minute consultations to kind of explain how we work, how we can help you, and you know, give any advice that you might be looking for. But we also are looking um you know, if you already work with us, hopefully this was just, uh, you're on the path, then great. And this just can kind of give you a sense of what lies ahead and what, uh, what comes next. So thank you very much for joining me. And, uh, we look forward to working with you in the future. Take care.